So my name is Liza Casabona. Uh, my presentation is about how story is a piece of my practicum. So it's about how stories work in organizations. Uh, so in 1989, a man named Ted bought a large tract of land in Northern California to pursue his passion. Uh, in the beginning, he proposed a challenge to the farmer he was working with to establish a large scale organic farm that made money. Uh, in the 1980s, there were not a lot of people doing this, particularly in the Napa Valley. Uh, so with a farming, f but he approached it from a business standpoint, right? Uh, that farmers should be safeguarding the soil or they would have nothing to grow. Business, you know, it's a business perspective, safeguard your most important resource. Uh, so with a farming first motto, Ted established a responsibly operated farm with the goal of proving that you could produce world-class wine using sustainable organic methods. Uh, not only because it was the right thing to do, but because his theory was that you could do a higher quality product at a lower cost. So today, that operation includes two certified organic vineyards, olive groves, fruit orchards, a livestock ranch, a farmer's market, and a wildly successful farm-to-table restaurant all run using what the company calls full circle farming. Uh, so Longmeadow Ranch uses an integrated farming approach that relies on each part of the operation to contribute to the health of the whole. So they maintain bees, they use the honey, and then the bees pollinate the orchard and the vineyards. Uh, they uh, maintain an egg laying poultry flock that also provides pest control and fertilizer. Uh, and then they use cover crops that are edible that they can then use in the restaurant. Uh, so the approach creates these beneficial interrelated loops, that, hence the term full circle farming. The vision statement of the organization is to be a family owned producer and purveyor of world class wine and food that is economically successful and socially responsible using diversified, sustainable and organic farming methods. But what are you more likely to remember? The story I told you or a canned vision statement? So today, you've heard my nine cohort mates tell you stories. Stories of where they come from and where they're going. Stories about the things they learned this year and why it matters to them. And ultimately, what each of those individuals was telling you was what their values, their vision, and their mission are. So now I'm gonna tell you one more story. But first, I'm going to tell you a few things about stories themselves to provide you a framework for the work that I did this year and to put some context on some of the stories you already heard today. Uh, your first question could be, what the heck do stories have to do with an MBA? Um, and it turns out actually quite a bit, because organizations and businesses are made up of individual human beings, and research shows that human beings have an innate predisposition for telling and hearing stories. Uh, stories are rarely just about what they appear to be on the surface, instead, Stories are often our best way to tell the world what we're doing and why it matters. Uh, there's a fair amount of research about storytelling in business uh, settings. It comes from a wide variety of disciplines, psychology, organizational development, marketing. Um, and here, I'm not talking only about an advertising or marketing strategy where a brand tells you a compelling story about a product, although that's a piece of this. Uh, I'm also talking about the stories that an organization tells itself tells its members and tells the outside world to show what drives it and motivates it and its reason for existing. Uh, organization myths, stories about a founder like the one I told you about Ted, uh, stories about how the company overcame adversity to succeed, and stories that you tell to customers, those all qualify. Uh, and there's a reason that organizations tell these stories. They're a really important communication tool and they can be very beneficial. Uh, so some of the advantages that organizations get from using stories in their communication strategy include uh, they provide a communication shortcut, they establish a common ground and values. Uh, because they often originate with a problem, they can highlight the path to a solution and the tools that you should lose al use along the way. Uh, and then they also make connections and highlight patterns. Uh, so stories are a fundamental piece of human intelligence. We create stories to help us remember things. Before we had technology as a memory aid, people told each other stories when they thought something was important and worth remembering. And that skill still exists. Used right, it can help organizations communicate vision, mission, and values in compelling and memorable ways. 
Uh, in many organizations, it's already a critical but often unacknowledged part of company culture. So according to a Stanford University study, we retain the information that we hear in a story far longer than we retain information in data points. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the retention rate for statistics is 10 to 15 percent, coupled with an anecdote that rises to 65 or 70 percent. So what's the takeaway? If you want somebody to remember something, tell them a good story. Uh, so, actually, I'll go back for a sec. Um, to give you a little bit of context, it comes as a shock to nobody that knows me that I landed on the topic of stories in a business program. Um, I was a voracious reader as a child. I loved stories. Um, once I could write, I wrote really terrible poetry and really pretentious short stories, some of which are pictured here, uh, <laughs> that my siblings enjoyed reading aloud at family gatherings for a laugh, still. <laughs> um, and I was a history major as undergrad because I th said, you can't tell better stories than have actually happened. Uh, and then I spent the first decade plus of my career as a journalist where essentially my job was to sit across from somebody and say, tell me a story. Uh, but I thought I was leaving all of that behind when I entered a business program. Uh, so last fall, uh, sorry, halfway through the program, uh, I knew I wanted to focus on business communications as my practicum, but I still thought it was gonna take me somewhere different. Uh, so I defined some broad research questions and I started digging and lo and behold, stories kept coming up over and over again in what I was reading about organizational culture, in the conversations I was having. And for the second half of the year, I caved and decided that I would allow that to be part of my practicum. Uh, and I decided what I needed to round out all of that research was the view from actual practitioners, people on the ground sort of telling company stories. Uh, so I designed a set of interview questions uh, I identified five individuals in communications-related roles that I thought might have some insight, and I set up interviews. Uh, and what I found over the course of those interviews backed up the research that I had been doing. Uh, stories came up as an integral part of what everybody was doing on a daily basis, whether they were doing it as a conscious tool or not. Uh, and the five organizations were all different, different sizes, different industries, different stages, uh, but there were some interesting shared traits across all five. Excuse me. So, uh, when asked about mission, all of them used an origin story to illustrate their point. Uh, language and how people talked about vision and mission were an important part of what everybody was doing. Uh, each organization had a stockpile of stories that they used to illustrate points aside for just from their founding. And all spoke about both formal ways of communicating, which would be like a mission statement posted on a website, similar to what Selena was talking about earlier, and informal ways, which is how people converse around the office, for example. Uh, and I'll give you some quick examples from the interviews that I did of the kinds of stories that I'm talking about. <clears throat> so one of my interviews was with a financial services firm uh, that has a focus on community built into its founding vision. Uh, the company's core values include uh, personal development of the workforce, uh, giving back to the community. And the company is focused, from its founding, it was focused on building a community of like-minded financial advisors that also appreciate the sense of community and camaraderie. Uh, and their focus is more on building a sustainable financial future for their clients than in meeting certain percentage targets. <clears throat> so as part of that mission, the organization is very careful about only hiring advisors that fit with their values. So every candidate goes through a traditional interview and vetting process. And then the last step before making an offer to any prospective candidate is dinner with the firm's CEO. And at dinner, in a restaurant, the candidate is watched to see how they treat the wait staff. Uh, so this is seen as an indication of what somebody behaves like when they don't think they're being watched, what they're truly like because somebody that treats a waiter poorly, or a waitress, might also treat support staff poorly. So it shows the organization a potential lack of value fit. Um, so this slide is a screen grab from their annual report, and I'm not sure how well you can see, but it calls out some of these connections and sort of camaraderie pieces, which is unusual for an annual report for a financial services firm. So another interview from another part of the financial services sector, different organization. Uh, this one was told to me by this organization, which is an employer branding firm. This is one of their clients. <clears throat> uh, so small community banks and credit unions have to compete against big mega banks. Uh, so 
it's important that they differ differentiate themselves in some way. So a financial products provider uh, has a meeting with the president of a small community bank. He's sitting in the lobby. The time of their meeting comes and goes. 20 minutes go by. So he sort of stands up and peeks around the corner to see what's keeping the bank president. And he can see the bank president seated at his desk across from a woman who is clearly not dressed for a business meeting. And the surface of his desk is covered in receipts and pieces of paper. So the services provider sort of shrugs and sits down. He continues to wait. So after 45 minutes go by, the service provider finally sees the woman leave, and the bank president comes out apologizing for being late. He says, no problem. I'm just curious who was the woman that you were meeting with before. And the man says, she's one of our clients. She overdrew her account several weeks back, and now she comes in every few days. And I go over her receipts and her bills and her income with her to help her get back on financial footing or strong financial footing. So the service, now picture that happening at a big mega bank. That's not going to happen. Uh, so the service provider uses that story in communicating with his own employees that it's very different what they're doing, right? They're providing services to these small community banks and that does not look like what it would look like in the other parts of the financial services sector. Uh, so the last interview I'm gonna tell you about uh, was with two women I know <clears throat> who founded their own company. Uh, it's a content studio, essentially a media website, uh, and a consulting firm that focuses on uh, diversity and inclusion issues using a bright, positive, affirming tone. <clears throat> so they have a really organic origin story. Uh, the founders, Rebecca and Amy, were friends, having a lot of sort of conversations about their personal challenges, as you do with your friends. Um, Amy is a first-generation Korean-American she was married to a first-generation Mexican-Colombian-American, and at the time, they were talking about having kids. So she's struggling with this idea of, they're both deeply rooted in their cultural identity. How do we create a shared cultural identity for our children? And at the same time, her co-founder, Rebecca, was planning her wedding. She's a Salvadoran Jewish-American, and she was the first person in her family to marry somebody who was not Jewish. So she's thinking about interfaith marriages. So the two of them are talking to each other about these things that they're thinking about and how they can't find anybody in the mainstream media talking about these things in a way that they identify with. It's mostly negative, it's mostly about problems, it's not positive, it's not affirming. So, but they and all of their friends are having these same conversations. So Rebecca looks at Amy and says, let's just do it ourselves. So they launch a media website. This is a screen grab from the current iteration. Um, they mostly curate columns by other people, uh, but they spent a year perfecting the tone and language with which they wanted to treat issues of race, culture, identity, blended families, interfaith marriages, all of that. And then after about a year and a half, they launched a consulting site, or consulting firm rather, and now they go into employers and advise them on how they can address these issues in positive, affirming ways. So that's a really organic, way to start a business, right? Like it came out of who they were as individuals and then they filled a need that they had identified. But the very, the culture of that organization reflects who they are as people. Uh, so at the top of my presentation, I said human beings have an innate gift and predisposition for telling and hearing stories and that stories are often our best way to tell the world what we're doing and why it matters. So if you look beneath the surface of those stories that I told you, you're more likely to remember that the financial services firm hires people based on how they treat the wait staff, or that the community banker kept a business partner waiting for 45 minutes to go over a woman's receipts, than you would be to remember a three paragraph mission statement if I read it to you. Um, stories, but so they, the stories tell you a lot about what the organization is like, what their values, their vision, and their mission are. Stories tap into our most basic skills and talents as human beings to interpret the world around us. And remember, and knowing that gives us a tremendously powerful business tool when trying to tell the world about a company's vision, values, and mission. And that's what we've all done today. Every single presentation you heard was a story of some kind about how, who we are, about the, what we want to do to change our lives, to change our careers, to change the world 
about the kinds of organizations we work for, the kinds of organizations we're interested in, and the kinds of organizations we want to build. Uh, we each told you a story, but ultimately, on an individual level, we each told you much more than that. We told you our vision, mission, and values. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>